what's a sign? You know, they take many forms, but certainly signs in the sky have always been signs from the Father. And there are some amazing things going on in the sky. It's not surprising that people would pay attention to the sky. It is, in fact, half of the environment. One of the things that people notice, besides the incredible grandeur and beauty of something like the night sky, or the majesty and the predictability of the phases of the moon and the sunrises and the sunsets, is the fact that the sky is a convenient source of order. But here on the Earth, in antiquity, people saw the sun seeming to move through the sky. They saw the moon move fast through the sky and change phases over the course of a month. They saw the stars come and go in different seasons. And those were all keys to survival. The tradition of using the stars and the constellations and so forth in the ancient Hebrew culture started in Genesis chapter 1. And it says that God himself placed stars and signs in the heavens and the atmosphere. The Jewish people later formed their calendar on astronomical observations and the sighting of the new moon every month from Jerusalem. But, very interestingly, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, calls a series of feasts in the book of Leviticus a moed, M-O-E-D. And these are appointed times that God deals with people on the earth or the Jewish people themselves. In Leviticus 23, the father tells Moses to tell the Israelites that he's got a calendar and he's got appointments on them. And he sums them up, there are seven appointments. There's Passover, there's unleavened bread, there's first fruits, there's Pentecost, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's the Feast of Atonement, and there's the Feast of Tabernacles. All of Israel's feast days have to do with the phases of the moon. Some of the feasts will be started on the new moon. So the moon is extremely important in the feast days. As a matter of fact, Passover has to have a full moon. The feast days are highly related to apocalyptic events, to the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the book of Revelation or the apocalypse without understanding the feast days. The book of the Revelation is the Messiah fulfilling the fall feast of the Lord. All those things that we were to rehearse that the scriptures speak of uh, from Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, day of shouting, uh, through Yom Kippur and the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles, it is all there embedded in there and it's all in the book of the Revelation. The Creator runs the universe according to His time clock, whether we recognize it, live by it, understand it or not, makes no difference to Him. The next feast that needs to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, and then after that, the Feast of Atonement, and then after that, the Feast of Tabernacles. These constellations are lining up. This is what Revelation 12 is talking about. Every single thing that's going to happen on September 23rd, factually, is mentioned in a book that's 2,000 years old. Is Revelation 12 describing Planet X? In a way, yes, it describes it as a fiery dragon of old. This is not Hollywood anymore. This is reality. This is where astronomy and the Bible meet. Is Planet X coming in? The answer to that is yes. There are some amazing things going on in the sky, and it shows a time coming of just utter destruction of the Earth. Can the events of the book of Revelation actually come true? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my world? These are the birth pangs that's setting this whole thing up at this time. These are the signs. This is not something where I'm giving you a doomsday scenario, but it is something that tells me that we need to pay attention. This is a warning. Ancient times, humans have looked to the sky with both reverence and fear. We saw it during the American eclipse, and we're about to witness it again, this time on September 23rd. The eye-catching spectacle can't be seen with the naked eye, but as we show you in this Arklatex In-Depth report, it is evoking a sense of doom, and it's something that's been predicted for eons. On September 23rd, 2017, some televangelists and YouTube enthusiasts predict a planetary alignment will fulfill a cryptic scripture prophesied in the New Testament. You're not alone. All of us are going through it. The world is crazy right now. 
The devil is about to unleash his wrath. We're out of here soon. The sign based on the book of Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 foretells the end times and deep sorrows for the nations. The Revelation 12 sign in a nutshell. The quote, great sign in heaven quote in the book of Revelation chapter 12 is the sign of the rapture. The rapture is the event before the end times period of seven years that comes before the 1,000 years messianic age. The rapture is when the overcomers and faithful followers of Jesus disappear, sparing them from the coming tribulation. Widely available modern astronomy software allows anyone to easily view and animate the night sky at any time in history or the future. For example, we now know what the star of Bethlehem was and how it lines up with all nine clues in the book of Matthew. The discovery of what it was explains, for example, why the Magi from Babylon knew what about it and everyone else didn't, and also how the star stopped over Bethlehem on December 25th, 2 BC. The details are in my video number five. The Revelation 12 sign, that is the rapture sign, is a celestial alignment in the night sky with many moving parts that make it so rare it occurs only once in all of human history. This includes a 42-week circular retrograde motion of Jupiter strictly inside the womb of the constellation Virgo. This Revelation 12 sign occurred on September 23rd. The details are in my video number 5. Quote, a woman clothed in the sun, quote, the sun is in Virgo for almost a month every year from late August to September, quote, with the moon under her feet, quote, this addition to the sign narrows down the possible dates for this sign to a couple days per year around the autumnal equinox, quote, and a crown of 12 stars, quote, above Virgo is Leo, which is associated with Christ's royal lineage in the Bible and is made up of nine principal stars. Mercury, Mars, and Venus make this 12 stars and makes this sign exceedingly rare. This is actually a celestial sign. It is actually only... A sign that happens one time <laughs> and what we see is uh it fulfills what's being said here in revelation 12 okay so this is talking about the end of time when the dragon's going to be thrown out of heaven let's just watch a little bit more and you'll see what i'm getting at particularly with with the solar eclipse just check this out it's pretty interesting the great american eclipse the Great American Eclipse passed over the entire continental U.S. on August 21st. As you will see, this was a sign of impending judgment on America. Genesis 1.14 says the, quote, lights in the expanse of the heavens are for prophetic signs and appointed times, quote. Here in point form is a list of the things about this eclipse. This eclipse's path is an uncanny division of the nation in half. The eclipse only touched the U.S. and no other country or island. The last time an eclipse only touched the U.S. was in 1776, the year the nation was founded, which is fitting if this sign indicates the end of the nation as we know it. The first minute the eclipse's path of totality first cast its shadow of darkness on the west coast in Oregon was the exact same minute of sunset in Israel. The same applies to darkness first touching Salem, Oregon, and sunset in Jerusalem. The path of totality went directly over seven cities named Salem. Seven is used over 500 times in the Bible to show God's touch upon something. The word Salem is Hebrew for peace. The sun going to darkness would imply no peace. Salem, Kentucky is exactly where the eclipse peaked. The eclipse entered the U.S. in Oregon, the 33rd state, and exited the U.S. on the 33rd parallel in South Carolina. The eclipse occurred 33 days before the Revelation 12 sign. Where the eclipse peaked is coincidentally exactly in the path of totality of the next Great American Eclipse that divides the U.S. in half seven years from now, this time going from south to north. The paths of both eclipses together form an X or a cross or a Tav mark. Tav is the name of the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet that has a numeric value of 400 and is the symbol for prophetic signs. In Ezekiel chapter 9, a Tav mark was placed on the foreheads of those with a loyalty and zeal for God. Their lives were spared during the judgment and destruction of Jerusalem, while those without this shibboleth were not spared. This is a prophetic foreshadow of the coming mark of the beast. Where the great American eclipse peaked is the epicenter of the New Madrid seismic zone, the location of the strongest earthquakes in U.S. history. The path of totality went directly over all of the seismic hot zones in the U.S. The date of the eclipse was the first day of the month of Elul in the Jewish calendar. This is 40 days before the Day of Atonement and is the beginning of what is called the Season of Repentance. After the Day of Atonement, it is too late to atone for sin. Okay, I wanted to mention something really quick. I just noticed something with this little drawing there, if I can get back to where it was. Okay, check this out. See how it's 2024 for the next crossing and he's saying this this could mean judgment right well 2024 is actually the end of the calendar when the 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 armageddon will occur according to this guy as well so we're talking about basically 
it's like it crosses right at the time of judgment when Armageddon will happen. So I find that to be interesting. Maybe it will happen just beforehand, like you're marked for judgment. And of course, at this point, we're talking about way well into, we're at the end of the seven-year tribulation time. There were two other famous eclipses in history that occurred on Elul 1, the beginning of the season of repentance. The Burr Segal eclipse in 763 BC is the most documented and famous eclipse in ancient history. It passed directly over ancient Nineveh just before Jonah arrived to preach 40 days of repentance or else judgment and destruction for the city. In the Bible, Jonah is recorded as being a contemporary of the king of Nineveh at this time. The discovery of the eponym cuneiform tablets revealed there were two plagues and a civil war in Nineveh in the two years leading up to the eclipse. These calamities in the eclipse prior to Jonah arriving explains why the Ninevites were mysteriously more than ready to receive Jonah's warning and repent, even though Jonah was a stranger and from the enemy tribe. Uh, if you guys recall uh, Jonathan Kahn's first book about 9-11 and how you had seven years to repent and all this type of stuff, it was 2001 and then 2008 we had the economic crash and after that it was 2015 which is when we had some of these first signs for the end times i find it kind of interesting because he was mentioning back here that america will be crossed uh it was crossed in 2017 and then it will be in 2024 right so that's seven years apart. So it has the first X across it in 2017 saying, hey, look, you're going to be judged, America. And then seven years later, 2024 is when it gets crossed again. You are judged, which would be at the end of the, assuming this guy's numerology is correct, that would be basically at Armageddon time, which means, well, pretty much the whole world will be judged at that point. But either way, what let's just say he's not correct about when Armageddon will be. Let's just say because first thing that has to happen before Armageddon is the sacrificial system will have to be put back in place. That will be the covenant. And a lot of people think it's a peace treaty, but it's actually a covenant, it says. It doesn't say peace treaty in Daniel 9. And it talks about there'll be a peace treaty that the uh, Antichrist will make, and then he'll break it halfway through, and he'll it'll be the abomination of desolation. So first thing's that has to happen is they have to start up the sacrificial system in the temple in Israel again for the seven years to start the final seven years okay they're assuming it's going to happen sometime in 2018 it sounds like so if you start seeing news about they're starting the sacrificial system in Israel again this guy's numbers are right on if you see that in 2018 now of course if, you, if it's like some years later you see it well then you'll know that's when the seven years start but either way, it's interesting that it was seven years between 2017 and 2024 when these eclipses cross each other, which is like a mark of judgment. It's like, here's your warning, 2024, here's your judgment for America, all right? So I just wanted to mention that because he didn't really say that. Uh, let's see here. There's, he's got lots of uh, crazy maps and stuff. Let's look at some more stuff here. <laughs> what in the world is this? All right, here we go. Weather disasters. And strongest hurricanes, there was the official deadliest and costliest wildfires in history, the worst mass shooting in history, and the worst mass shooting in a church in history. Incidentally, the worst mass shooting prior to Las Vegas was in 2015 in an Orlando gay nightclub on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50, as it was when Moses came down Mount Sinai after 50 days to find the Jews in open hedonistic rebellion. 50 people died in this shooting. Before the Revelation 12 sign and the Great American Eclipse slash sign of Jonah, there was another massive sign on July 17th. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, Archangel Gabriel explains to Daniel that there are 70 sets of seven years to come for the Jews and their expected Messiah. He described how after 69 sets of seven years, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and its walls, would be the arrival of the Messiah. The decree was recorded later in the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 as being the first day in the Jewish calendar in the year 445 BC, and this is confirmed by the Royal British Observatory as being March 14th, 445 BC. The details are in my video number 2. 69 times 7 years equals 483 years. All ancient cultures use 360-day calendars, as does the Bible, including another prophecy. So 483 years times 360 days equals 173,880 days. March 14th, 445 BC. 
plus 173,880 days equals April 6, 32 AD, the day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as king on what is known as Palm Sunday. Jesus was crucified on the Passover in 32 AD, and April 6 is confirmed by the Royal British Observatory as being the Sunday before Passover. This prophecy speaks of the Messiah being killed and then afterward a period of, quote, desolations, quote, before the prophecy's resumption with the final set of seven years. The 70th set of seven years, for which Israel was restored in the 20th century, is the end times period. Okay, so I wanted to also mention that there is a video about a guy, apparently there's some rabbi, German rabbi. Uh, the prophecy was by a guy named Judah ben Samuel. Basically, a number of things he predicted came to pass, uh, and it basically details it here. And so their whole idea is it correlates per, quite well with the Bible and what they're talking about here. And it break, basically breaks down the last seven years as starting in 2018, based on Scripture and on also this guy, Judah ben Samuel's prophecy. Okay? So I, I just wanted to mention that really quick before I get into more of this here. The last four blood moons tetrads have coincided with war or calamity for Jewish people, including the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492, what had been their main homeland for 1,000 years, the rebirth of Israel in 1948, and the capture of their ancient capital Jerusalem in 1967. As I will show, the significance of the blood moons tetrad of 2014-2015 is equally stunning. Last on my list of signs to summarize briefly are the Jupiter-Venus conjunctions of 2015, 2016, and 2017. It is believed by many, myself included, that the Jupiter-Venus conjunctions in 2 BC was part of what was the Star of Bethlehem that the Magi recognized. Okay, so you can see clearly that we have lots of signs in the heaven that show that we're definitely in the end times. There's a lot of things going on in the heavens that are being fulfilled. Uh, the Star of Bethlehem coming back. I mean, there's just so many things. So that shows you that something's happening because it says in Scripture you'll know uh, by the times and seasons and, and signs are given in the heaven four times and seasons to let us know when things are going to happen. Now, of course, if you look at the Apocrypha and Pseudepigraphia, it makes it very clear that there's 6,000 years and in the last 1,000 years is the 1,000-year the reign of Christ. So you have 6,000 years from creation until now. And they're claiming that basically we're coming near the end of the 6,000 years. And after that, it's a thousand year reign of Christ. Now, of course, if you believe in evolution and all that kind of stuff, you think we've been around billions of years, millions of years. I don't believe that, but <laughs> that this is just what scripture says. So this is how it works. When you start seeing headlines about the sacrificial system starting up again, that would basically mark the beginning of the seven years. Which, from what I understand, what I'm looking at here, all the signs in the heavens, the Revelation 12 sign that happened back in September 2017. Now, some are saying Obama is the Antichrist. And that's very interesting because we had this recent painting come out of Obama. And, some are, and I've also read about, uh, what is it, photo, portrait, I, I'm trying to look it up here. We also heard about him potentially being the head of the United Nations, which would make sense. The United Nations might be the one who would coordinate something like bringing back Israel into the sacrificial system or something. This is very strange. You know, there was also something about him being potentially the head of the United Nations. I find that to be very interesting as well, because then that would fit into this whole idea that Donald Trump is the seventh king and Obama's the sixth and eighth. You know what I mean? The, all these guys coming out saying, oh, the rapture's April 2018. I really don't like that for a number of reasons. One, I saw this interesting post. It was actually on LinkedIn, which is kind of strange. But it's a, a very long post about why the pre-trib model doesn't make sense. And actually, I actually tend to agree with it. I actually have you know, studied this a number of times over the years. And I always tend to come to the same conclusion that it's basically like in the middle of the whole thing. Because what we're talking about is the first part of what you see in Revelation is the Great Tribulation, which is where things are going wrong, okay? We might even be, be seeing 
you know, the sun being dark and the moon and the stars falling. This this actually is about the time when, when Christ would be coming back, as they say, in the rapture or in the gathering. It depends on how you want it, because some people don't like the word rapture. Um, but it, it makes sense that, you know, if you read even the words of Daniel, it sounds like we are protected during the part of the wrath. So you have first, you have the tribulation, which is the first three and a half years. And then after that, you have God's wrath. Okay. So obviously it doesn't make sense that Christians would be under God's wrath, but it does make sense that Christians would be under um, the great tribulation because the great tribulation is not God doing something. It's the devil doing something. Okay. What do you, where do you think this is going to go? You think this is going to go in a good, go, good place? And what about those people who reject these things? Those who reject the chip in the brain or in the forearm uh what what happens to those people you know uh event maybe at first be like oh well, you're just uh you're slow behind the times and then eventually you're just you're an outcast to society and then they're going to be hunting you down this is sort of the idea and of course you're going to want to be able to live off the land at that point because you're not going to be part of the matrix anymore you're an outcast you're not part of the system and uh, obviously you're going to need Jesus at that point. I hope you're already a Christian. If you're not, I hope you start to wake up to this, this whole thing. It's pretty crazy if you think about it. Next time you see this plant in your backyard, don't cut it down. Because this is the best natural painkiller you'll ever find. Some people even compare it to morphine. This common plant is called wild lettuce and was commonly used by Native Americans two centuries ago for both food and medicine. So today I'm going to show you how to make a simple wild lettuce extract to keep in your medicine cabinet and use whenever you need it. Now if you take a leaf or stem and squeeze it, you'll see a white substance coming out. This is where the potency of the plant lies. Because of this white juice, the early European settlers also called it opium lettuce. This milky substance doesn't contain any opiates, but it's working on the central nervous system directly to lessen the feeling of pain. Nowadays many people are turning their attention back to this lost knowledge and use it as a replacement for addictive prescription pain medicines. So let's avert our gaze from our modern survival thinking for just a bit and look at how our great-grandparents did it 150 years ago. This is exactly the kind of information I found in this 350-page book called The Lost Ways. This is probably the only survival book I've actually enjoyed reading. You won't believe how many survival things we've lost to history. I found the wild lettuce on page 113 and decided to make my own painkiller. I collected about 50 leaves today and washed them thoroughly. So the first thing you should do is grind them up in a blender, not very thinly, and only just for a few seconds. Place the ground leaves into a wide pot and add just enough water to cover them. Now place the pot on the stove on low heat for 30 minutes. Do not let it boil because you'll destroy all the good stuff in it. Stir every 15 minutes until the water reaches a dark brown color, just like this. Now pour the substance, while still hot, into another pot through a strainer. Almost none or very little plant material should get through it. Try to squeeze as much water as you can while the plant is in the strainer. This solution contains all the core elements of wild lettuce, especially the pain-killing essence. But it's not concentrated enough, yet. So in order to obtain this essence, you should warm it over low heat again until the water is vaporized basically dehydrating the solution until it becomes a paste like this. Be careful at the end when there is little water left. You should not burn the extract at the bottom of the pot. What you should have now here is pure wild lettuce extract. You can pour it in a small glass container like this and put it in your medicine cabinet for later use when you'll need it. Wild lettuce is unscheduled by the FDA, meaning it's legal to grow, own, and forage without prescription or license, just like how the Native Americans used to heal their pain. In the Lost Ways, you'll find lots of these common and valuable weeds with pictures. How to identify them, how to prepare them, and how to use them. All with different medical effects. Because when the medical system collapses, this will be the only option you have to heal yourself. I personally happen to know the man behind this book. Claude is an old-fashioned guy by any standard. He lives with his wife and two children in a log cabin he personally built. Cooks outside on an open flame in a cauldron most of the time, and all of his clothes are handmade. He has a 150 square foot root cellar stuffed with all sorts of homemade canned foods and goods and he raises cows, sheep, and chickens. I thought several times to myself that this guy will never be troubled by any crisis. Because the coming crisis we all prep for is what folks 150 years ago called daily life. 
No electrical power, no refrigerators, no internet, no computers, no TV, no hyperactive law enforcement, no Safeway or Walmart. They got things done or else we wouldn't be here. In the next seven minutes, Claude will unearth a long forgotten secret that helped our ancestors survive famines, wars, economic crisis, disease, droughts, and anything else life threw at them. A secret that will help you do the same for your loved ones when America crumbles into the ground. He's also going to share with you three pioneer lessons that will ensure your kids are well fed even when others are rummaging through garbage bins. In fact, these three old teachings will improve your life just as they did for me immediately once you hear them. My name is Claude Davis. You may know me from my website, askaprepper.com, or you may have seen my warnings in the media, but few of you know me personally. My story is emotionally heavy, with struggles and disappointments, but also with a faith in God and a strong will to survive that finally led me being here. So pay close attention, because this video will change your life for the good. Lesson number one, don't take anything for granted. My grandparents from my father's side came to America from Ukraine just before the Second World War and started a small farm in Texas where I grew up without missing a thing. But my grandfather wasn't so lucky. When he was only 12 and still in Ukraine, he survived one of the most horrific famines. Of the hundred families that lived on his street, only 20 survived. So what you're about to hear is a real recollection as it was written in a personal journal just after the crisis by one of his neighbors. Where did all the bread disappear? I do not really know. Maybe they've taken it all abroad. The authorities have confiscated it, removed it from the villages, loaded grain into the railway coaches, and took it away someplace. They've searched the houses and taken away everything, to the smallest thing. All the vegetable gardens, all the cellars were raked out, and everything was taken away. It was so dreadful that every day became engraved in my memory. People were lying everywhere as dead flies. The stench was awful. Many of our neighbors and acquaintances from our street died. We tried to survive the best we could. We collected grass, goosefoot, burdocks, rotten potatoes, and made pancakes, soups from putrid beans or nettles, collected glay from the trees and ate it, ate sparrows, pigeons, cats, and dogs. When there were still cattle, it was eaten first, then the domestic animals. Some were eating their own children. I would never be able to eat my child. One of our neighbors came home when her husband, suffering from severe starvation, ate their own baby daughter. This woman went crazy. Another neighbor wrote a petition to the authorities, and here's just a paragraph from that. said, Please return the grain that you've confiscated from me. If you don't return it, I'll die. I'm 78 years old and I'm incapable of searching for food for myself. And of course, nobody cared. In a crisis, it's everyone for himself. Although in many cases, families did still remain families. But just after the winter, when there's absolutely nothing to eat, my grandfather, together with his mother, went to the nearest town where the government had established a soup kitchen. Unfortunately, the 25-mile journey was too much for his mother. After just five miles, she couldn't walk anymore. My grandfather noted in his journal, Mother said, save yourself, run to town. I turned back twice. I could not bear to leave my mother, but she begged and cried, and I finally went for good. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm a father myself, and when I read these things, I burst into tears. Now, please allow me to take a wild guess here, without getting mad at me. Your life's not perfect, but at least you have a computer or a mobile device to watch this video on. Your fridge is probably half full, and while you have your problems, starvation is not one of them. And even though your job or retirement could be more enjoyable, you probably have enough money to at least get by. And that's great, but make no mistake taking this for granted. History has shown us many times that it can all fly away in a split second. The biggest misstep that you can take now is to think that this can never happen in America or to you. All that my grandfather and our ancestors who came here and formed America lived through would be in vain without lesson number two. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Now call me old-fashioned, I don't care, but 
I completely believe in America and what our ancestors stood for. They all had a part in turning this land into one of the most powerful countries in the world. Many died and suffered before a creative mind found an ingenious solution to, maybe, a century-long problem. Now, believe it or not, our ancestors' skills are all covered in American blood. And this is why these must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same for our children and our children's children. But now, my friends, we're sitting on the edge of oblivion. Our fathers and grandfathers were probably the last generation to practice basic things like building a root cellar or making pemmican. Our ancestors laid the bricks and built the world's strongest foundation that we're about to irreversibly forget. And we're going to pay the ultimate price for this, because if you have a big, strong house with a weak foundation, it doesn't matter if it looks nice on the outside, the next flood will sweep it away. And that is exactly what will happen to most Americans in the coming crisis. So here we are, human beings in the 21st century, several lifetimes and a world away from our grandparents and their ways. Have we become better at living? I think not. I watch as we have become ever more expectant that the world owes us a living. Consumerism has reached epic proportions and people feel aggrieved if they don't own the latest gadget. The truth is, we never have been more disconnected from life, from the world, from the soil, from the trees, and from our own souls. We're straying away from our roots on a dangerous road from which there will be no turning back. And the good and the bad news is that we're the last generation that can truly do something about it. We no longer know how to live without refrigerators, without cars, without phones, without supermarkets. What will you do tomorrow if you simply are unable to buy things? I sometimes think that we're kidding ourselves with our bug-out bags and with our three-day food rations. Wouldn't we be better off looking at what the pioneers took with them when they traveled from Independence, Missouri all the way to Oregon City? Game meat was unreliable even then, so don't think that they made this five-month journey counting only on that. If your life depended on this, what bug-out bag would you take with you? I know I'd stick with whatever the pioneer had with him. He had to travel weeks on end without much help while taking cover from some native tribes at the same time. And this is just a small, tiny example. I don't want to see our forefathers' knowledge disappear into the darkness of time. And if you care about your family and what America stands for, then neither should you. This is the third and most important lesson of all. It's always up to you. Now, I believe in God and in the power of free will. And I believe that you are the only one in charge of your destiny and that you're constantly making decisions that shape the rest of your life. Now, it's true we all had different starts depending on our families and upbringing. But for most of us here in the United States, we at least had decent beginnings. We had water and food. We could go shopping from time to time. And we had decent medical system compared to other countries. We should be more thankful for that. And we should ensure that we have something put aside for darker times. If anything goes wrong with this country, don't blame the government or the president. They don't truly care about you or your family. You'll be the only one in charge of your fate. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but nothing falls from the sky. God helps you, but He doesn't lay it on your table. You have to work hard and do things yourself. As long as you're aware of this, your destiny rests solely on you and your willpower. Now, you can truly change things, and you can do a lot more than you think you can. With this idea in mind, five years ago, I wanted to do something that hadn't been done before. Something that not only would help me survive a crisis without investing a fortune in stockpiles, but something that I could do around my house on a daily basis using only methods that were tested and proven by our forefathers for centuries. I wanted to unearth and learn the forgotten ways of our great-grandparents. I went to my grandfather to find out how he survived and to learn the little secrets that helped him stay alive in spite of almost everyone else dying. Now, he was almost 90 years old, but the old man was still in good shape. For three weeks on end, I absorbed his lessons like a dry sponge. And on top of that, we built a lot of things together. 
including a root cellar and a storm shelter, just like the folks did when he was young. We made lard and ham, and we smoked four turkeys and preserved them for winter in four different traditional ways, and a lot, lot more. Now, when I was a child, I was raised by my grandparents, but I hadn't spent much quality time with them until then. In fact, there were months when we barely even spoke, not because we couldn't stand each other, but only because I was always too busy working or taking care of my kids. A lame excuse and a thing that I deeply regretted later on in life. Well, my grandfather passed on a couple of years ago, and with him, a magnificent amount of survival knowledge. Now, I don't know if you're in a similar situation, but think about your grandfather and how many things he did or knew, things that will vanish forever into the dark abyss of ignorance. And because I deeply believed in lesson number three, that I was the only one who could change something, my goal for the last couple of years changed from not just learning, but saving our forefathers' ways. This is one of the most important things I've done in my life, and I'm proud of it, but it took me five difficult years. Now, first, there's no person that knows all our forefathers' forgotten secrets. Let's just say there are still a handful of people that still practice a lost skill transmitted from generation to generation, even today. But not all the skills, of course. I had to get in touch with a lot of people. Second, where do you find these guys? They are no mainstream survival experts. They don't have a website or TV show. And some of them even live in remote areas with no internet or TV cable, earning a living like the pioneers did. Third, I wanted to do something unprecedented. You know, articles like 11 skills your great-grandparents had that you didn't, and they started listing the skills. Hunting, fishing, foraging, butchering, and so on. Well, you know, this kind of information will never help anyone. I needed something solid, exact, and to the point. Not just skills, I wanted to know things that they actually built, ate, and stored, and exactly how they did it. And fourth, I'm not sitting on a gold mine. As much as I enjoyed traveling and learning these skills, I still needed to go to work. But what I didn't realize when I started my quest is that you can't save these skills only by writing them down. If all these writings will be forgotten in a dusty drawer right next to my bed, it won't help anyone. This knowledge will die together with me, and all my efforts to save our forefathers' ways would have been in vain. So this is because all my life I blindly believed in lesson three, that it's always up to me. But I was wrong. In this case, it's only halfway there. It's also up to you. Today is your chance to be a part of saving our ancestors' lost ways. I wanted to make this information available to every family out there without having to spend years of their lives or thousands of dollars. So I came up with this great idea to edit all my manuscripts and turn all this lost knowledge into one of the greatest books of this century. The Lost Ways, Saving Our Forefathers' Skills Now, as you can see, I designed and edited the book in an old-fashioned way. But most of it is not written by me personally, because I didn't want people to read a second account. I'm sure a lot of information would have been lost in this process. You know, those little secrets that make a thing really work? Those little things that make a big difference. So I paid these experts for their time, and I got what I wanted. These people are not professional writers, but instead are uniquely special. They're neither the strong, badass type that you see in Rambo movies, nor the ultra-rich preppers from reality shows. They're simple people who know a lost skill very, very well. They're smart, shrewd, and wise enough to survive for months or even years in the world's most remote places. Now, here's a glimpse of what you'll find in The Lost Ways. You'll discover the lost remedies used by our ancestors for centuries. And I'm not talking about rare and complicated insights that only a botanist knows. I'm talking about plants that grow in your backyard or around your house. Very common weeds. For example, this common driveway weed is one of nature's most powerful survival plants. It's not only edible, but it's super nutritious, easy to identify, has no poisonous look-alikes, and is used as medicine. Following the instructions from the Lost Ways, go ahead and use this underestimated or discredited plant 
and make yourself a powerful antimicrobial and cell regrowth bandage. Or simply make a tea with it that can be used for a wide range of digestive problems and toothaches. Native American Eric Bainbridge, who is on the board of directors of a Native American educational and took part in the reconstruction of the native village of Kualoklo in California, will show you how Native Americans build the subterranean roundhouse, an underground house that today will serve you as a storm shelter, a perfectly camouflaged hideout, or a bunker. It can easily shelter three to four families. So how will you feel if, when all hell breaks loose, you'll be able to call all your loved ones and offer them guidance and shelter? And besides that, the subterranean roundhouse makes an awesome root cellar where you can keep all your food and water reserves year-round. From Ruff Simmons, an Old West history expert and former deputy, you'll learn the techniques and methods used by the wise sheriffs from the frontiers to defend an entire village despite being outnumbered and outgunned by gangs of robbers and bandits, and how you can use their wisdom to defend your home against looters when you'll be surrounded. Patrick Shelley, who earned a living in the woods for years on end, will show you how to make foolproof traps. He wrote an awesome chapter about how to trap different animals in winter just like our forefathers. When 100 hungry mouths will shoot each other over the last deer to feed their children, your family can eat the favorite food of trappers and mountain men from the 1800s. From Shannon Azares, you'll learn how sailors from the 18th century preserved water in their ships for months on end, even years, and how you can use this method to preserve water for your family cost-free. Mike Searson, who is a firearm and Old West history expert, will show you what to do when there's no more ammo to be had how people who wandered the West managed to hunt eight deer with six bullets, and why their supply of ammo never ran out. Remember the panic buying in the first half of 2013? Well, that was nothing compared to what's going to precede the collapse. From Susan Morrow, an ex-science teacher and chemist, you'll master the art of poultice. She says, if you really explore the ingredients from which our forefathers made poultices, you'll be totally surprised by the similarities with modern medicine. Well, how would you feel in a crisis to be the only one from the group knowledgeable about this lost skill? When there are no more antibiotics, people will turn to you to save their children's lives. If you liked our video tutorial on how to make pemmican, then you'll love this. I'll show you how to make another superfood that our troops were using in the Revolutionary War, which even George Washington ate on several occasions. This food never goes bad, and I'm not talking about honey or vinegar. I'm talking about real food. And the awesome part is that you can make this food in just 10 minutes, and I'm pretty sure that you already have the ingredients in your house right now. Now, really, this is all just a peek. The Lost Ways is a far-reaching book with chapters ranging from simple things like making tasty bark bread, like people did when there was no food, to building a traditional backyard smokehouse, and many, many, many more. And believe it or not, this isn't all. If you get the Lost Ways right now, you'll also receive three exclusive reports that will be off the table soon. There's an old saying that our great-grandparents used to know. Once in life, you need a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman, and a preacher. But every day, three times a day, you need a farmer. So, the first report you'll get is what every survivalist should grow in his backyard. This special report contains the most nutritious and toughest plants that you should start growing so you'll never run out of food. These plants are reliable in the worst possible conditions, including drought, flooding, or light deprivation. And you'll also find instructions on how to plant, grow, harvest, and store them. I'm also pretty sure that you're familiar with this 150-year-old saying that it's not the strongest species that survived nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So, the second bonus you'll get is how to outlive an EMP, the Early Pioneer Way, which is a day-by-day -day guide that shows you what to do after an EMP every day for 30 days using the Lost Ways. Think about it this way. If an EMP had struck in the late 1800s, nobody would have noticed it. 
Our great-grandparents didn't even know what an EMP was, nor do they know what modern technology was. But they surely lived, survived, and prospered without it. Now things are a little bit different, and because this event can happen all of a sudden with no warning whatsoever, it might be difficult for even the smartest minds to know what to do from the moment the running water stops and your food spoils to the moment when looters come knocking at your door. So, in this report, you'll learn the 10 things that you should do on day one, what you should make on day two, what you definitely need to turn to on day three, and so on until day 30, when you'll be absolutely 100% self-sufficient, protected, and able to help others if you want to. Unless you're living in a bunker full of stockpiles, doing these things in the wrong order may literally mean death. Now I'll show you what to do every day so you'll never run out of water, food, or heat, and then what to do or build to improve things day by day. Another old saying people used to say is, for every minute you spend organizing, an hour is earned. So the third report you'll get is a step-by-step -step guide to building your own can rotation system that can hold at least 700 cans of different sizes. You'll never have to look at 50 cans for expiration dates, and you'll never need to throw away cans again because they've spoiled. A can rotator is not only a time saver but also a money saver. As you can see in this video, the mechanism is very simple. Whenever you buy new cans, you insert them in the upper shelf. The cans will automatically roll down, and they'll be the last in the row. When you pick them up, you do so from the shelf below. So you'll always pick the can that you bought first and therefore with the closest expiration date. Cool and efficient. The one you've just seen in the video, I built with only $95. Pretty cheap if you think that a similar rotator costs $420 on Amazon and holds only 450 cans. And theirs aren't even that cool. Now, once you have the plans and the step-by-step -step guide with pictures, all it takes is just one day of work, even less. So, if you choose to save the lost ways now, you'll also get these three exclusive bonuses that are worth $29 each for free and unlimited access to the members area where you can ask me anything at any time. I'll be there to answer your questions and to help you if you need any clarification on anything. By knowing the ways of our forefathers, believe it or not, you're covered for anything. You'll never have to spend money on any prepping material again. And forget about unreliable and expensive modern survival equipment. Why even bother with reinventing a wheel when these things have been working right for centuries? The Lost Ways prepares you to deal with worst-case scenarios with the minimum amount of resources, just like our forefathers lived their lives totally independent from electricity, cars, or modern technology whatsoever, which means you'll also be bulletproof against the ever-increasing threat of an electromagnetic pulse, a powerful economic breakdown, famines, and natural disasters. You'll have the power to protect and save your family, even to rebuild your community during the worst of times. And besides that, The Lost Ways is not merely a survival book, because most of the knowledge you'll find in it will begin improving things in your life starting today. And what I'm talking about is the type of self-sufficiency that our great-grandfathers used to have. I'm talking about things that they did around their homes and the healthy lives that they lived. And at the same time, you get to take part in doing something great, saving our forefathers' lost skills. Now, I consider that I've done my part, the hardest and costliest part, if I may say so. All you need to do is to make sure that you hand this knowledge over when it's time to and take full advantage of it until then. Now, I've shown it to some expert preppers and readers of mine, and some of them said that they would easily pay $1,000 just to learn these skills. I even thought of creating a weekend workshop and charging at least $500 for a seat. You know, there are a lot of people that do that. But I realized that this would be wrong because only a handful of people will actually learn the lost ways. And while my main focus is not to get rich, but to save these skills by spreading this knowledge to other people just like me. Now, remember when a man's word was his bond? When you made an agreement and you just shook on it? Well, frankly, I'd like to do things the old-fashioned way here, on a handshake, 
So today, you can just shake my hand and seal the deal for a price that anyone can afford. While this video is still up, you can get The Lost Ways plus the three bonuses for a one-time special offer of just $37. But the only way to get it is to click the Add to Cart button below now. The way I see it, you have three options here. You can hope that things will get better and that a crisis will never strike America. And I'm hoping the same thing, by the way. You know, but my grandfather taught me better. He taught me, as I've told you, to never take anything for granted.